In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. You could read for us, sister. You could unmute, sister. Yes. Thank you, Father. <laughs> the reading from the Acts of the Apostle. Why? Meeting with them, he enjoined them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father, about which you have heard me speak. For John baptized with what? For John baptized with water, but in a few days you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. When they had gathered together, they asked him. Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom to Israel? He answered them, It is not for you to know the times or seasons that the Father has established by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. And you will be my witness in Jerusalem, throughout Judea and Samaria, to the ends of the earth. Thank you, sister. Let us pray. God our Father, we thank you this evening together at St. Paul's Bible College, as we have come together to read and understand the Acts of the Apostles, the so-called the Book of the Holy Spirit. Your Son commanded your Apostles not to leave Jerusalem until they are filled with the Holy Spirit. We here stand in the premises of Jerusalem that we shall be filled by your Holy Spirit, that we may continue to become your disciples and witnesses in our family, in our workplaces and in the society. We make this prayer through Christ our Lord. Amen. Good evening, everyone. And hearty welcome to this lecture on the Acts of the Apostles. We have today new students and some guests, especially I would like to thank Mr. Arun Rebero for his presence here. He was my companion at Haggai in the United States and he has been my good brother so thank you mr arun for joining us and we have sisters from vietnam and we have sisters from holy cross today have, they have joined us new and we have regional deputy regional secretary father savari ryan who is also the zonal coordinator and today in fact we have students from malaysia vietnam and two from sri lanka and from india so the college is truly becoming international on behalf of the chairman bishop, I invite every one of you to this lecture. Good. So this is the scheduled lecture for our Sunday, the last Sunday of the month. But this Sunday being the last day of the year, and we may be getting ready for liturgies, and we may even go for the New Year Eve celebrations or mass. So we thought we would anticipate the lecture. That's why we have anticipated to today, that's Friday, the previous Friday of the last Sunday of the month. And this Sunday is the, this month is the last month of the year. So we also thank every one of you for your patronage to St. Paul's Bible College as a superior of a community or as an individual who has been contributing and who has been learning. Thank you, everyone. Good. So as usual, for the newcomers, the session will have two parts. The first session will last till 4.45, then we'll have five minutes break, then we'll resume at 4.42, 450 to 530. Good. You may keep your questions, insights ready for our discussion at the end of the second hour. Good. Before we proceed to the Acts of the Apostles, I would like to ask your first impressions about the Acts of the Apostles. So this is not a new book to us, and we have been constantly in touch with this book on various occasions. So we'll quickly share with each other the first impressions that you get are the insights that you have received as far as the Acts of the Apostles is concerned. Good. You could unmute and share. 
this could be in a form of a question or in a form of an insight or in a form of a kind of a appreciation for the book Apiyak Satya Pasuts. Anyone would like to? Maybe one or two expressions about the acts of the apostles. Maybe to begin with, I said during prayer, it's the book of the Holy Spirit. Yes, yes, Mr. Emmanuel Prasad. So that it is the separation of Christianity from Judaism. Very good. And spreading from Jerusalem to ends of the world, as good. noted in one eight. Good. Thank you, Mr. Emmanuel. So it's a separation from Judaism to so from Christianity. So Christianity begins to have its own identity. And just Christianity does not remain having an identity. It begins to expand its missions. Very good. Thank you, Mr. Emmanuel. Like you have brought out the two perspectives. That is one, discontinuity from Judaism and continuity in terms of mission, expansion of mission. Thank you, Emmanuel. Good. Anyone else? You could unmute and talk. Or any text which you find interesting in the Acts of the Apostles? Any narrative, any character? Mr. R.K.? Yes, Father. Without this yes. book, we want to say the Church of History, Father. Very good. So without this book, we can't understand the history of the church. Very good. Thank you, Mr. Aki. So from Thank the you. point of view of secular literature, we can say this particular book acts as a hyphen between the, the apostolic period and others. Or even we can say the book stands between Jesus and the rest of us. So that creates a connecting point as far as the history is concerned, even theology is concerned. So that way it becomes a uh, hyphen point or a connecting point for our uh, history, Christian history and Christian theology. Good. Thank you, Mr. R.K. So the first one we said discontinuity and continuity. Second one we have understood two expressions, Christian history and Christian theology. Anyone else? Time. Okay, good. Maybe we shall discuss later also. We'll have time. Good. With this little introduction to through our insights of the participants, we enter into the lecture proper. I shall share my screen with you. I hope you are able to view my screen. This particular presentation is made but from the booklet which you have received or which you have seen online, authored by Reverend Dr. Joe Michael Selvaraj. Good. The lesson outline is as follows. First, we will discuss the background information to the book. Number two, relationship between Luke and Acts, because by and large, it is agreed that Luke is the author of the third gospel and the Acts of the Apostles. Thirdly, we will see how the Acts of the Apostles acts both as history and theology, as Mr. R.K. mentioned just now. Then we will see how the book is structured. Then we will discuss under three cities or three areas where the disciples become witnesses. They are witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. In fact, the entire book of Acts of the Apostles is kind of a paraphrasing. Paraphrasing means kind of expanding the words that we heard from our sister being read. Chapter 1 of the Acts of the Apostles, verse 8, where the Lord tells the apostles, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. Then he tells, and you will be my witnesses, telling people about me everywhere in Jerusalem, throughout Judea, in Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. Kindly take this particular words if you have the Bible with you. Look here, seven, sorry, eight. You will receive the power. So the receiving the power. So which means you will be just recipients of grace. So when we compare it with 
the gospel of luke but especially in the narrative of the annunciation story when mary was given the message that she will conceive and bear a son mary finally responds saying let it be done to me she does not say i shall do it for you or i shall do it so there is no active participation of mary but what mary does is she makes herself passively available i think that is the key to understand so here the apostles are asked to be the receptacles or the recipients of the holy spirit so they are just to remain passive and god will make you something i think that is the starting point for any mission often times we think we have to do our mission but as far as the mission is concerned mission is lord's and he just asks us to receive the holy spirit and he tells beautifully you will receive power when the holy spirit comes upon you so that is paraphrased where in the narrative of the pentecost where the apostles who were in the upper room with mary were filled with the holy spirit so that is the first narrative the text is talking about verse 8 of chapter 1 then he continues and you will be my witnesses so you will be my witnesses so here suppose the same words are same expression we have found, we have found in the gospel of matthew as well when jesus gives the great command the great mandate when he sends the apostles go into the ends of the earth and make disciples so it's a kind of more or less disciples so here luke follows or uses the word witnesses so here we need to understand jesus does not say you will be my devotees but he tells either you be my disciple or you be my witnesses what is the meaning of a devotee a devotee usually objectifies the deity for example we go to a church we go to a temple or we go to a worship place where when we go as a devotee there is a distance between the deity whom we worship and us but as far as the disciple is concerned there is a sort of closeness and more than that when you become a witness you become part of it the bit the word witness is a legal word so suppose i am a witness to a murder or i am a witness to a transaction what is the implication i am close to the person who has initiated and completed the transaction so that way i am becoming part of that particular act so when you become witness you become the very salvific one of the persons who are very close to jesus participating in the salvific act of jesus so that way jesus does not want his disciples to be devotees but he wants them to be apostles more than that as witnesses that is the second thing to understand third one telling people about me everywhere so you are duty is to just proclaim wherever you go and how that expands he tells beautifully first in jerusalem so there we have immediately after after the reception of the holy spirit at the pentecost even peter begins to talk to the people in jerusalem so the mission begins there jerusalem then throughout judea they go around in jerusalem and the nearby places then it goes to samaria then finally to the ends of the earth through paul and when paul reaches rome the book comes to a close because that time it was considered rome was the end of the earth or rome was the final place of the earth and that was the roman roman kingdom the entire uh, judea jerusalem samaria galilea galilee was made part of roman empire so reaching rome would, what would mean that if the gospel has reached the end of the earth so that way the book in fact paraphrases 18 or we can say 18 is a summary of the entire book of the acts of the apostles so three things number one reception of the holy spirit or pouring out of the holy spirit number two the apostles become witnesses number three gospel is preached to the ends of the earth i think that would in fact summarize the entire uh, entire acts of the apostles into one verse so these three we will see here 6 8 6 7 then 8 how jewish mission was taken care by peter 
and gentile mission was taken care by Paul and his companions. Finally, we will conclude saying the significance or the message that we can receive from the Acts of the Apostles. Good. Now we go to first section that is background information to the book. First one, to introduce, more or less, it is agreed that it is the continuation of the third gospel. How we are able to realize it? We could take chapter 1 and Acts of the Apostles, 1 verse 1. There, Luke writes, In my first book, I told you, Theophilus, about everything Jesus began to do and teach, until the day he was taken up to heaven, after giving his chosen apostles further instructions. So he goes on to say that in the first book, so which means what is the implication? This is the second book, and this is in continuation with the first book. But as far as the nature of the book is concerned, the first book is more of a gospel. That's a different genre. Why this is more of a history or theology. We'll see shortly how we can distinguish. So Luke was able to contribute to literature in two ways. Number one, he added to gospel and he added to history. Then second one, more or less it is understood that Luke is the author. And this particular book is about the way. The way. The way also is significant both in Luke and in the Acts of the Apostles. In Luke, if we say, the entire gospel happens on the way. Because Jesus, when he, when he it, in the gospel of Luke chapter 9, we read, when the time came for Jesus to be ascended to the Father, he set his face towards Jerusalem. So from chapter 9 onwards, what we have is Jesus going to Jerusalem. Or Jesus is on the way to Jerusalem. So the entire gospel happens while Jesus is on the way. Finally, even after the resurrection, the resigned Christ meets the apostles on the way. The two of the disciples who were going to Emmaus, they were met, encountered by Jesus, and that happens, encounter happens on the way. So that way, you can say the way becomes key thing before resurrection and after resurrection. And coming to the Acts of the Apostles, the believers of the first church, the early church, were called the followers of the way. That's what we have in Acts 8. We will see how Paul was trying to persecute the followers who were on the new way. So the new way, like they understood as a new way. And besides that, the entire Acts of the Apostles happens in the way, the way in the sense the people, the disciples, the apostles are on mission. So that way, the way becomes a way of kind of understanding what the early church people, like it referred to the early church people, and also it referred to the mission of the apostles, especially Paul in his missionary journeys. Then fourth one, this is the place, as Mr. Emmanuel said, there is a discontinuity from Judaism to Christianity. In Acts 11.26, we have a beautiful saying where the people, the believers, are called Christians in Antioch. And because from there, in fact, the real discontinuity has happened. So that way, Acts of the Apostles become a key thing for us. And what is the title? Some people, like, they tend to call this as Acts of the Holy Spirit. Some call us Acts of Peter and Paul, because even though we say Acts of the Apostles, so only two apostles are covered. A little information about James when we have the Jerusalem Council. A little information about John together with Peter. Otherwise, we have all the information on Peter and Paul. Even we have Philip. Philip is not an apostle. Sometimes we tend to confuse. Philip is an apostle. So there, Philip is a deacon. So Philip and Stephen, they are deacons there in the Acts of the Apostles. So as far as the apostles are concerned, we have Peter and Paul. Besides, we have James as a person who convokes the Council of Jerusalem and John as somebody who accompanies Peter. Good. So, but however, today we take to understand the title as Acts of the Apostles. So this comes from the early church tradition. But this particular title is not mentioned anywhere in the, in the entire book. So nowhere it is mentioned, it's the Acts of the Apostles. 
but the title comes from the tradition, the patristic tradition. Good. Now, question comes, who has written it? Or who is the author? Earlier we said, any authorship could be established at two levels. Number one, internal evidence. Number two, external evidence. For example, internal evidence would mean where the author has put his name anywhere in the text which he or she has written. That is internal evidence. For example, Book of Sirach or Ben Sirach. There we have Yesu, son of Ben Sirach. So which means it's the internal evidence to say the author has inscribed his name onto the book. But as far as the author of Acts of the Apostles is concerned, first uh, there is an internal evidence where the author says, I have written to you and now I am writing to you. So in the preface, more or less indirectly, the author conveys to the audience that somebody is writing. And who is that person? I, later, we have in the missionary journeys, the we text, especially when Luke accompanies Paul and his companions, writes, we went to meet this place, these people. So we, so the inclusion means the author, in a way, participates in the missionary journeys. So that way, the author makes this book as a kind of a chronicle or a journal or a diary. So from there we can say there is a part of internal evidence to convey that the author is participating in the very writing of the book. However, the author's name is not mentioned. Secondly, the external evidence from the patristic times even later till the final canon of the book in the Council of Trent, more or less people have agreed based on the patristic writings, especially of Irenaeus and Origen, they say like this book was written by Luke. So more or less today we agree on the authorship. Luke is the author of Acts of the Apostles. That's why in studies, like you go for higher studies, Luke and Acts, they are always studied together. So they come under one. Now we celebrated recently John the Evangelist. So John has equally larger amount. We have John, Gospel of John, Book of Revelation, and three epistles. So he has five books to his name. While Luke has the gospel, then Luke has the Acts of the Apostles. So when we put together, more or less, Luke takes one third of the New Testament. John also takes another one third. So the rest of the book, that is one third are other gospels and other writings. That way, Luke and John occupy a key place in the entire New Testament. When was it written? More or less, we can set it as 60 to 63 AD, the kind of a Jewish revolt happened and Roman Empire was challenged. The different places, some say it was written in Antioch, some say it was written in Philippi. And what was the scope? So Luke here wants to present a kind of a 30 years of history and theology from Jesus' ascension to Paul's entry into Rome. So more or less we can say this is the scope of the book of Acts of the apostles then the genre the type of literature it's kind of praxis in greek which means acts acts of individuals so it's a kind of a diary writing where somebody narrates about it's not merely biography but more or less biography being interpreted so that's a kind of acts and it could be about cities or persons so here we have about persons and this is not purely historical, this is not purely theological. If it were to be historical, like it would be a biography. If it were to be theological, it would be a kind of interpretation. But we need to understand, Acts of the Apostles has both elements, elements of history and elements of theology. And coming to the purpose that is slightly built on scope, we can say, this is a record of selected events on the road to Rome. So now the church travels from Jerusalem to Rome. And not all the events are recorded. Only the selected events that could be convenient or that could be helpful for the entire early church community. So that is a selectivity is involved. Then number two, Jesus as the builder of his church. So even though the entire book talks about the apostles and their companions and journeys, what stands behind is 
the narration about Jesus Christ and narration about the Holy Spirit. Thirdly, it was a kind of apologetic book. Apologetic means defending, defensive. So in a way, it wants to tell what Christianity meant or how Christianity differs from Judaism. That is apologetic. And kerigmatic, which means it contains how the creed was proclaimed. That is proclamation. Conciliatory. Conciliatory means kind of a reconciliation. Like there were some tensions, tension between Peter and Paul, or tension between Judaizers and Christians, or tension in different churches, tension on circumcision. So these tensions were reconciled. So that way, this book acts as a conciliatory book, telling stories about reconciliation. Then in a few places, we have exhortations. Exhortation means a kind of encouragement. So when Paul talks to the elders at Ephesus, he tells, I have never gone after anyone's gold or silver. So which means indirectly, he tells the elders to be like him, to follow him in humility, simplicity, and especially in integrity. That is exhortation. And finally, catechetical. Catechetics means like it wanted to convey to the early Christian church what it was meant to be a Christian, or what is a Christian doctrine, or what is Trinity, name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. So slowly all these theologies emerged, and these theologies were conveyed to the people through catechesis. So that way this book acts as a catechetical tool as well. So these are the different purposes, or these are the areas with which we need to look at the entire acts of the apostles. And to look at the salient features of the book, we can say the gospel has a direction, that is vertical universalization, in the sense Jesus is born, then Jesus does the ministry, and Jesus undergoes passion, dies, and resurrects, and finally ascends to heaven. So what happens here? There is a vertical universalization. In the sense, Jesus was born alone, growing, then there is a family close to him, then the father, disciples, apostles. So slowly it expands. So once Jesus reaches there, ascension takes place, there's a kind of a universalism, universalization, because already Jesus told the apostles to leave and proclaim the gospel. So that is. But so there's a vertical. And because Jesus ascends from human nature to divine nature, from the world to God. But as far as the acts of the apostles, there is a horizontal universalization. Like it begins with Jerusalem and goes to Rome. That is the end of the year. That way, that horizontally, it universalizes. Thirdly, this is a key to understand Paul's epistles. For example, Thessalonica. So Paul writes to Thessalonians. So we now more or less know where Thessalonica is through his missionary journey. Romans, because Paul goes to Rome. Corinthians, Paul was in Corinth. Paul's epistles have connections. So Timothy, Titus, all these people are mentioned here in the Acts of the Apostles. And fourthly, as Mr. Emmanuel said, there is a transition from Judaism to Christianity. Especially, Christianity had to leave certain features that were unique to Judaism. For example, circumcision, following up the law. So these two were key things. And even Sabbath. So they were not allowed to enter into the synagogue. So these types of problems were there. And now how Christianity disassociates from this own mother, kind of mother or a father, Judaism, and tries to assert his or her identity. That is the fourth one. Finally, we are able to understand early Christian community, especially how they were together in koinonia, communion, sharing of bread, Eucharistia, breaking up the bread, then diaconia, service, and they were for Kerigma proclaiming. So that way we are able to understand the early Christian, real early Christian spirit. Today, our Holy Father talks about synodality. Synodality is a kind of going back to our roots where the church celebrated at its vulnerable situation every one of its members. So that type of returning to our roots is possible when we read the Acts of the Apostles. Good. I pause here if you have any doubt. This is not a break. Steve to have to see whether you are with me. Do you have any doubt on what we have seen so far? Okay, good. Father? Father? 
Yes, Mr. Emmanuel. Father, shall we say that the book of Acts is a compare and contrast in between Peter and Paul? Okay. How do you qualify that, Mr. Emmanuel? Uh, same, uh, similar events are uh, written yes. for Peter and Paul. Very good. We will see them shortly. Thank you. Yes. And uh, even with one Jesus, more question, Father. Kind of parallelism. Yes, Mr. Emmanuel. One, one more question, Father. Do speaking of tongues still symbolic of uh, having Holy Spirit in our present days, Father? Uh, it depends, Emmanuel, how you interpret it. Okay, speaking of the tongues, and we are not sure whether they speak in tongues because that's uh, another question. And how do we verify that this is uh, based on the Holy Spirit? We are not sure. Okay, and each okay. preacher or each evangelist interprets his way. So I think we can't okay. really verify as an outsider. But we can say as okay. Paul beautifully in First Corinthians 14. So you okay. talk in whatever language possible, but that should be an interpreter. So without that interpreter, if you try to convey something, then I think you are misleading people. That's what Paul is heavy on, especially on speaking on tongues in the first thank Corinthians 14. So if you understand in that yeah, thank way, you. we can say it has its own problem. Okay. Good. Thank you, Mr. Thank Mr. you, Father. Good. Very good. Good. We continue. I share my screen with you. Good. Already Emmanuel has initiated the discussion, Luke Acts relationship, similarities and differences. We'll see now, see quickly how there are different parables we can identify between Luke and Acts of the Apostles. So we'll just mention one or two, then we'll quickly go to the other similarities. Look at the table here. We have Luke and we have Acts. So here there is preface to Theophilus at the beginning of the gospel. Then here as well, there is a preface. Here spirit descends on Jesus. Here spirit comes to apostles. Then sermon declares prophecy fulfilled. Here sermon declares prophecy fulfilled. That's a Peter's sermon. Then Jesus heals a lame man. Lame man. Then Peter heals a lame man. So it continues like that. And later, Paul is being compared to Jesus. Look here, Jesus travels to Jerusalem. Here, Paul travels to Jerusalem. Finally, towards the end, Jesus is rejected by the Jews. Paul is rejected by the Jews. So kind of a, it's a total parallelism. Then parallelism between Jesus and Peter, then Jesus and Paul. So that way, Peter and Paul, they in a way act as shadows, or they act as replicas of Jesus in the acts of the apostles. And there is also kind of a symmetry. Symmetry means kind of uh, closing together where one completes the other. Let's take some examples here. Begins with an address to Theophilus, Theophilus. So it closes. It's a kind of a symmetry. means a shape that closes each other. Here there is an announcement made by Gabriel. Here announcement made by two angels. Like the angels tell, like men of Galilee, why do you look, stand, why do you stand looking at the sky? Then begins in Jerusalem, Luke, because the first narrative is about Zacharias in the Jerusalem temple. So that way Luke begins his gospel in Jerusalem. Acts of the Apostles also begins in Jerusalem. Jesus tells, remain in Jerusalem. So that way the Acts begins in Jerusalem. The birth of Jesus as the Spirit comes upon Mary. Here birth of the church as the Spirit comes upon the church. And Mary is beautifully present here again in the upper room. Then a general movement towards Jerusalem a gentle movement away from Jerusalem. So that way, Jerusalem, Jesus moves from Galilee to Jerusalem. Now there is a movement from Jerusalem to Rome. So that way, the journey continues further. So this is a type of symmetry that we feel. Then there is a kind Can of... Can we a, say inclu inclusius, Father? Inclusius. Ah, uh, inclusius, we, can, we could say, Mr. Yeah. Emmanuel. Then kind of a mirroring. Mirroring is like a more or less similarities. So we can say one example could be earthquake following prayer. So there was a, a prayer by Peter. So here's a Peter Paul mirroring. Like whatever is done by Peter, parallelly done by Paul. So like Peter is mirrored by Paul or Paul is mirrored by Peter. So that's a kind of a, like both apostles are key elements, are key present, key, presented in a similar way as far as the acts of the apostles is concerned. 
so there is symmetry there is similarity there is mirroring good we got a third one with this we'll take a break access history and geology first one it is slanted history so what is the meaning of slanted history slanted history means history like so history usually moves in chronology so like a, it begins in zero and goes to hundred so this is how it develops that's a regular chronicler history but slanted history means you begin to take a shape shape and it passes in a particular moment and tries to slant and look back again the same event for example now the apostles are filled with the holy spirit then the story begins to evolve then there is a moment comes where people at samaria are filled with the holy spirit so what is the implication then the reader immediately has to fall back to the first event of the pouring out of the spirit so that way the history constantly takes you back so as a kind of a slanted history they call it so acts is a history but there is no chronology like how it went by day by day a day one day two that type of diary history is not there chronicle history is not there slanted history whereby there is a constant passing and constant going going back as far as the events are concerned the interpretations of the events are concerned that's number one number two selective history as we mentioned earlier all the events are not mentioned but only the events that are pertaining to the life of the early church are selected and recorded third one there are few contradictions like ascension of jesus so we have the ascension story as we have here in jerusalem but as far as matthew is concerned matthew does not have ascension story mark has ascension story john does not have ascension story so really we do not know how ascension took place because in the gospel of matthew jesus tells tell my brothers to go to galilee so if we have to take ascension as far as the matthew is concerned there is no narrative but we can interpret their ascension takes place from galilee but as far as the acts is concerned ascension takes place from jerusalem so there is a contradiction then mission command as far as the mission command is concerned mark tells go and proclaim and they went and proclaimed but for matthew go and make disciples go and give baptism but here luke's mission command is totally different he just tells you will be my witnesses so this does not say you shall be or you become so there is no imperative there is no command it's only a kind of a proposal so even the mission commandment has its own contradiction then paul's conversion story for example in 9 we have the prime story of acts the conversion of paul so he tells i went from this city to there and i fell and i was blind but other people were able to see but later when he explains to agrippa he tells i was able to see and others were not able so really who became blind we don't know but when it comes to the galatians he tells i he does not mention anything about damascus even paul suggests tells i went to arabia in the desert and i was there alone so now paul's real version is that he went to arabia but luke writes he went to damascus so really we do not know the real Paul's conversion story. So there are contradictions in the story itself. Then Judas' death, when we compare it with the Gospel of Matthew and the narrative here in the Acts of the Apostles, there is a contradiction. And we have a lot of miracles and we have a lot of speeches. The speeches are very important as we have in the narrative in the Gospel where different hymns, for example, Mary's hymn, Magnifica, then Zacharias, Benedictus. So in the same way, Luke has a lot of speeches, especially Peter's speech, the major one, then Stephen's speech before his death, then later Paul's speech at Athens, Paul speaks to Ephesus, elders. So these are different speeches. So through speeches, the author wants to convey different exhortative elements. That's a kind of storytelling through speeches. Second one, Acts as theology. Acts of the Apostles as theology. So here we have a clear expression that god a savior jesus a savior so jesus is the savior of the world in the gospel of luke when it was announced to the shepherds the angel mentioned a savior is born for you so that savior who is born is jesus 
and Jesus is the savior, Jesus' name alone saves. So that theology emerges in the Acts of the Apostles. And message of salvation to which all are invited. Universality. So it's not only to the Jews, but to all, especially to the Gentiles. The coming of the Holy Spirit, preaching of the apostles, establishment of the church. And the universality is important to us because, but for these acts of the apostles, we can never become Christians because we are all Gentiles. We are all non-Jews. So which means Christianity is not a Judaistic religion, a Jewish religion, but everyone is invited. So that type of universality is possible only on account of the acts of the apostles. And it continues Christians' response to the preaching. Like people began to have faith in Jesus. There was repentance and conversion, baptism, following up Jesus, testimony, prayer. So not only the disciples or the apostles preached, but people also responded. Then we have five words, kerigma, that is proclamation, koinonia, communion, they came together, they held everything in common, eucharistia, breaking up the bread, that is thanksgiving, diaconia, service, that is deacon, then marturia, that is witness, Stephen was a witness. So these five words, in, were in fact, kind of have five missions of the early church, we can say, proclamation, communion, thanksgiving, service, and witnessing. Then world affirmation. So here, when we compare with the Pauline literature late, later, or even when we compare with the John's gospel, there's a kind of a world negation, like world is seen as something evil, especially in the literature of John, especially in the book of Apocalypse, Revelation. So world negating, but here world affirming. Because if we negate the world, our mission is not possible. So that way, world has to be seen in a positive light. So here, Luke sees the world as somebody, some, as something, a place where we can really work our mission. So world is no more to be rejected. Then salvation as a key thing. Salvation not after our death, not at the end of the world, but here and now. So that type of salvation, we'll see it shortly. Then last one, Arusia or eschatology, where Jesus will return immediately. So that type of expectation was there even in the apostolic times, and it continues to be so even today. Good. Now it's 4.44. We now hear pause for five minutes, then we resume at 4.40, yeah, 4.45, 4.50 we'll resume. I'll stay back. We'll resume after five minutes. Good. Thank you. Father. Yes, Emmanuel. Father, in the uh, text from the book of the Prophet Joel, mm. in chapter 217, shall we take it as messianic or eschatological or both, Father? You mean pouring up the Holy Spirit? No, no, Father. 217, that uh, sun and uh, moon will be blackened. Ah, okay, okay. Ah, okay. So that's more eschatological. Oh. Mm -hmm. Yes, because they this because the text is not in a way like in a Christian reading we give a messianic interpretation, but as well, far as the Jewish reading is concerned, it's an apocalyptic type. Well, okay, good. Well, one more thing, father. Yes, Emmanuel. From that from uh, thirteen seven that the uh, sequence for the Barnabas and Paul up to thirteen forty two thirteen seven it will be Barnabas and Saul. After 1342, it is Paul and Barnabas. Okay. Continually. Is there any significance in it for me? Uh, maybe some say like because of the composition, like the time composition might be different. But other than that, mm -hmm. we don't have any theology to see like how names are. Maybe, maybe okay. uh, later Paul, Paul takes precedence. So maybe and earlier, Barnabas introduces Paul to the mainstream of process. Okay. And later, okay. it's Paul who's taking the lead. Maybe that way we can understand. Okay. okay. Good, Emmanuel. Good. In, uh, in 215, Father, mm -hmm. Jews say that uh, these uh, apostles, they are uh, filled with the new wine. Yeah. But they replied, uh, it is not at uh, 9 a.m. Yeah. That means, uh, can we can take some after 9 a.m.? <laughs> 
Chips. <laughs> Ada? No, Emmanuel. It's just a kind of way of saying uh -huh. that they would be there till that 9 a.m. That intoxication would be there. So that type of interpretation. Oh. <laughs> so, uh, night, night taking. Yes, hangover. Uh, thank you, Paul. Good. Thank you, Manuel. Uh, Very good. Anyone else you'd like to add to what we have reflected together? Or you have any question? Uh, Father, I have a question. You told yeah, about yes, the conversion uh, story. Uh, there is a contradiction uh, uh, about Paul's travel to arabia or to damascus yes, so yes, as a christian what I, I have to follow which one i have to follow or to believe okay <laughs> <laughs> good mr Aaron. maybe how the scholars interpret the contradictions is like each narrative has its own scope okay so here they uh, the scope of paul writing to galatia is to Amidst the false prophets or false witnesses, he has to say that his gospel is more authentic than theirs. So there, like he wants to say, like the gospel was personally revealed to him. So that revelation part takes place in Arabia. So that way, the scope of the narrative is totally different. So here, instead of seeing the contradictions, when we see the context, I think there will not be any problem. This is how we understand. Okay. Good. Thank you. Thank you. Good. Very good. We resume. I resume the presentation. Thank you for your questions and insights. Good. We go to number four. Structure of Acts of the Apostles. As far as the book, the literary structure we are going to discuss. Number one, there are different structures. So as I said earlier in different classes, structure is not like a no text has its own internal structure. So the structures are always pushed from outside, either from a scholar or from a student, and that person justifies. So that way, we can propose any structure to any book. And we can always say, like this particular structure follows this, we can give a rationale for any structure. So this particular structure we have, which is proposed by the author of this particular booklet, is as follows. Number one, introduction, 1, 1 to 241. Then Christian mission to the Jewish world, 242 to 1224. Then Christian mission to the Gentile world, 1225 to 2831. But here this structure could be questioned because we are already in, in the first narrative that is about the Pentecost itself. There is a mention of all the nations. So people from different places gathered in Jerusalem. So that way we can say at the Pentecost itself, the Gentile mission has begun. Maybe here the author wants to tell and justify the structure based on the missionary journeys or the lead by different apostles. So here the lead taker is Peter, here lead taker is Paul. So that way we can say this structure is possible. However, this structure could be questioned. So as I said earlier, any structure could be proposed, validated and questioned, provided we are able to give a rationale for that. Good. Key verses, some key verses, if you understand, we can understand the entire book. So the first key words already I explained to you when I explained to you the outline. So here it reads, you will receive power. So that is the disciples or the apostles have to be the passive recipients. Then Holy Spirit is the protagonist, the main actor. Then you will be my witnesses. As we said earlier, no devotees. Even not even disciples, but more than that, witnesses. Where? In Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. That way, the entire gospel flows to the ends of the earth. So this is the first thesis statement or first key we can take. The second key is Paul's, sorry, Peter's signature statement. So today, when we go to a bank or any management study, they talk about vision statement and mission statement and the signature statement. So what is the signature statement? So maybe uh, there is a kind of difference between mission statement and signature statement. So mission statement is what I hold this as my mission. So suppose I want to be a priest of this kind, giving importance to evangelization or proclamation of the word or teaching. So this could be my mission. My signature statement means 
looking at my life the other person gives a summary of my life maybe this person or this priest has these values or this priest has this many priorities so they as a kind of signature statement is made by someone who observes me closely or who follows me closely or who is close to me so here look in a way gives an signature statement about peter so the signature statement reads like this now when they saw the boldness of peter and john and perceived that they were uneducated common men they were astonished and they recognized that they had been with jesus so here if you understand here this particular recognition was the problem for peter where in the passion narrative where when people recognized that peter was close to jesus and the galilean peter denied it but now that very recognition becomes the signature statement for peter like people were able to recognize that peter was with jesus and here look at the contrast uneducated common men but they were invoking or they were creating or they were making astonishment possible wherever they went peter and john and another thing to note here is the motive of recognition so reflecting on this fulton sheen tells like somebody uh, observes us will that person be able to say this person is with jesus i think that is the ultimate signature statement that we can have in our life so suppose somebody looks at us and tells he is a great banker or a finance person or he is a professor he is a teacher or he is a proclamation man he is a religious he is a religious sister or he is a priest so this could be signature statements but if that person tells he has been with jesus i think that is the type of signature statement we must try to live up to and peter lived it so anyone who saw peter could realize that he was with jesus so this is an insight from fulton j sheen good then we go to paul's vision statement so paul about as far as paul is concerned so some people say it's a vision some say it's a mission so some people try to equate vision and mission statement how do we understand this here paul is paul's vision or paul's mission is revealed to ananias how god tells this man that is paul is my chosen instrument to proclaim my name to the gentiles and their kings and to the people of israel so in fact paul was a instrument paul considered always himself as an instrument for what instrument to proclaim jesus as name so not his own name but jesus as name and to whom gentiles their kings because paul will be encountering different governors and kings then finally he will encounter the jews that to the people of israel so this is the movement for paul so in fact the gospel begins from israel judaism and reaches to gentiles but here paul begins his mission with the gentiles and goes to the jewish people so that way there is a kind of a reversal of the direction as far as peter's journey is concerned there is a movement from judaism to the gentiles cornelius house but here paul is a reversal paul begins with the gentiles and comes to the jews so at the end of his journey missionary journey and finally reaching to rome he will meet the jews there in a house then we go to three types of witnesses witness in jerusalem good so take the world seriously so this is the first message that we get from the angels that appeared when jesus ascended they say why do you stand here looking into the sky the same jesus who has been taken from you into heaven will come back in the same way you have seen seen him go into heaven so karl marx when he talks about religion primarily talks about christianity he tells any religion promises a pie in the sky when you die but here we have a different perspective that we don't look for a pie in the sky when we die but we take the world seriously so here the angels invite the apostles to look into the not to look into the sky but to look into each other so that the world has to be taken seriously second one here this particular text tells how mary was in prayer so here mary the mother of jesus i think from here only we have the expression mary is the mother of the church that is the day the monday which follows the pentecost sunday 
is treated or celebrated as Mary, mother of the church, Mater Ecclesiae, because he, she is the mother of Jesus, and Jesus is the church. Because when Paul was questioned by the risen Lord, why do you persecute me? So Jesus tells, why do you persecute me? Which means what is the implication? I am the church. So Jesus is the church. And Jesus is the church means when Mary is referred as the mother of Jesus, Mary is the mother of the church. And this mother is presented as somebody who prays. That is the expression we have, Mother Ecclesiae or mother of the church. And there is a reversal of Babel in 2.6 here. At the sound of the multitude came together, they were bewildered because each one was hearing them speak in his own language. But earlier in the Babel narrative, people could not communicate. People were confused at the communication that was happening. But now people were able to recognize and understand. That's the beauty. So that we're reversal of Babel. And from all to all, all things were collected from all people and given to all people. So like there was no one who was in need. So here we read 242 and 432. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching. Who are they? They are the early church people. Teaching, fellowship, breaking up the bread, and prayers together. And they held everything in common. So that type of one in mind, one in spirit, that type of life they led the early church, early church community or early Christian community. The name of Jesus was given prominence. Here we need to understand a little theology. What is the theology? Now, the event happens in Jerusalem. Jerusalem is the temple, the temple of Jerusalem, the Judaic, Jewish, Judaistic temple. There, people believed the name of Yahweh dwelt in Jerusalem. So now, all the people who were in Jerusalem were used to that name, four-lettered word, Yahweh, Adonai. But now, the apostles proclaimed different name. So what is the name? name of Jesus. So name of Jesus takes over name of Yahweh. And that's why we have here in 3.6, Peter said, that just happens near the temple. I have no silver and gold, but what I do have, I give to you. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. So here the name is qualified, plain, Jesus Christ of Nazareth. So which means only one Jesus Christ who came from Nazareth, and in his name, so here again, name becomes important because the name theology evolves in Jerusalem. Secondly, in fourth part, we have, there is no salvation in no one else, or there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. So here, the same thing is taken by Paul writing to the Philippians. But now in the multi-religious context, how do we understand that there is no other name except the name of Jesus. So in a multi-religious context today, with the understanding of the church after the Second Vatican Council, I think we need to proclaim that Jesus is a savior. And on the other hand, we need to be very sensitive, especially in a multi-religious context ours, when we have this particular expression that only in Jesus' name there is salvation. So that way we can say we need to take this title to proclaim. So for proclamation, it's an imperative, but for uh, living it out, we need to be very careful because in a situation like uh, any any religion today wants to be fundamentalist, that way no religion would try to open itself to understand that Jesus Christ is the only savior. So we need to be very careful when we use these particular words today, especially in the light of the uh, Second Vatican Council, it makes clear after that Nostra Aetate, we need to respect the race of truth in every religion. <laughs> then we have divine origin. In 538 and 39, in the present case, I tell you, keep away from these men and let them alone. For if this plan or this undertaking is of man, it will fail. But if it is of God, you will not be able to overthrow them. You might even be found opposing God. So here, Gamaliel's Gamaliel is instructing the Sanhedrin. He tells this particular work of the apostles has divine origin, which means don't touch them. So in our life also, if anything is from God, how do we verify it? If it, it is lasting, 
it is from god so it does not last this is not from god this is from our own initiative or from our own effort so that way the church is able to last because it is of god this is how we understand how the early christian community had faith vision and clarity of mission so this is a beautiful text we have in 6 where the apostles just on a fine morning they said when they encountered a problem in serving at the table when the widows were left out so they tell it is not right that we should give up preaching the word of god to serve tables but we will devote ourselves to prayer and to the ministry of the word so here the early church had a clarity of mission so today if we understand our mission often we have left out the proclamation only we are serving the tables we are serving different people but the real ministry of the word real prayer i think we have missed and we need to have this clarity of mission as a collective church then stephen was the first martyr where we have the text saying saul was guarding the clothes of the persecutors and god was in fact guarding saul so saul is first introduced at the stephen narrative when the stephen the deacon stephen was murdered and massacred so that's in jerusalem now we go to the next section judea and samaria philip's initiative philip here we need to understand it is a deacon it's not the apostle philip asks the person who was traveling by car do you understand what you read the chariot it's like a more or less closer to emmaus narrative where jesus in jesus interferes and asks what are you talking then when they came up out of the water the spirit of the lord carried philip away and the eunuch saw him no more and went on his way rejoicing so here philip is immediately removed so that philip does not take any pride in his action so everywhere the disciples the deacons the apostles they were controlled by the spirit so the movement of the spirit was more powerful than the movement of the persons then saul becomes paul so these are the four stories i said here acts 9 22 26 galatians 1 so but here there is also another narrative where it reads paul receives his call through barnabas which means barnabas takes paul to the mainstream apostles so we can say it's a kind of false occasion narrative like paul is called by the lord to take up his mission so as i said earlier we need to say they take these differences in terms of their context like why there is a difference because when paul tries to explain his own self to different people he uses different strategies so that way we need not see the stories as contradictory but we can say they are complementary they try to complete the information one from the other then peter's transformation this is a good story when we have synod and synodality the first phase one of the images that our holy father proposed was peter's transformation oftentimes we tell people how to transform not the apostles but here peter is transformed through the vision and he comes to Cornelius' house and he becomes a learning person so the synod what happens really the church that is peter the peter the train office is the pope's office now pope is being transformed our pope is learning from the local church so to understand or to underline that holy father told that this cornelius image or peter at cornelius house should be one of the images for a discussion on synodality because he tells peter lifted up cornelius saying stand up i too am a man so here peter presents himself not as a god but as a man which means like peter now gets transformed so now how do we understand it peter had an understanding like a farmer so what is the understanding of a farmer a farmer standing in a field he has a spade so water flows from the canal and with his spade he would control so he would control to which area the water has to flow but now suddenly there is a heavy rain pour pouring of rain now entire field is filled now the farmer is helpless with a spade so now compare the same thing with peter peter is a farmer who tries to control the holy spirit like where it has to flow on whom it has to be poured but now suddenly he realizes that cornelius house everybody is poured with the holy spirit so now peter comes to the realization like it's not in our hands 
that we direct the Holy Spirit to go this way, to go that way. But God can even take control of us and we can pour Holy Spirit like the rain on everyone. So that's the transformation Paul or Peter undergoes. That's a good image, in fact. Oftentimes, in our image, in our life, also we think like a farmer, we can control the field, we can control everything with our spade. But God always takes control. He outpours, outpours and pours out and fills the entire field with his rain. So that way, God is more powerful than us. That realization comes to Peter when he was in Cornelius' house. The apostles become martyrs. Herod begets James. Herod imprisons Peter. Peter is saved by God. And finally, Herod dies. So that way, apostles in a way follow the footsteps of their master. Then going to the last section, witnesses to the ends of the earth. Here, Holy Spirit tells, while they were worshipping the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, Set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. So here, set apart. This is a good expression. Paul, when writing to Romans, he tells, I am the apostle set apart for the proclamation of the word, for the gospel. So being set apart. What's the implication? In the Old Testament, Godesh, that is holiness, meant to be set apart. Like God called the people of Israel as holy. What is the meaning? You are set apart from the rest of the people. So setting apart could be two things. For example, when we eat a particular meal, maybe Upma we say, we set apart curry leaves or the chilies, which we don't want to take. So we set them apart because we don't want to have them. So there is a kind of that setting apart is a rejection. We reject them as not important or not needed. But second type of setting apart is reserving. For example, we set apart a perfume, we set apart a pair of shoes, or we set apart a suit for a particular occasion, which means reserved, which is something more important or which is more precious. So here, Paul and Barnabas are set apart. So we need to ask ourselves, we too are set apart by God for a purpose. And when we understand our life's purpose, I think we'll begin to contribute more towards our life. That is, be set apart. Then, ever ready. So here we have the spirit of Paul. So the event happens in Acts 13, where after reading from the law and the prophets, the rulers of the synagogue sent a message to them, which means Paul and his companions saying, brothers, if you have any word of encouragement for the people, say it. And immediately, Paul takes advantage of that and immediately proclaims. So today we need to ask, many times in our workplaces, people ask, brother, sister, you tell something to us. But how often we have used that opportunity to tell about Christ? For example, we have Christmas season. In our office, maybe we are one of, we may be a few Christians working there. So the manager tells, maybe you could tell, you could give a Christmas message or you could give a New Year message. How many of us really take the word of God and make that situation as a situation for proclamation? Sometimes we evade saying, okay, oh, no, I am not ready. Or sometimes we say, like we say in a secular way, try to pass, try to please everyone, not to, hug, not to hurt anyone, or we try to be politically correct. But Paul always took advantage of the situation and he made it a possible to proclaim the word. So that way we need to, in every possible way, it is important that we be ready to proclaim the word of God. Then, God's stone. So here's a content, it's a very beautiful story in 14, where Paul and Barnabas, they were called as gods because they said, the gods have come down to us in the likeness of men. But immediately, what happens? They stoned Paul and dragged him out of the city, supposing that he was dead. I think this is a kind of a mob mentality or a crowd mentality where people just are taken up by emotions. They are carried away by emotions. But Paul, in a way, miraculously is saved by the Lord. And we have a very beautiful text that is Jerusalem Council. So today, when the church is being discussed, so today people don't was don't want the Third Vatican Council. Third Vatican Council could be political because already the church is becoming political, taking side with the, the different secular elements and different secular strands. But what we need to have is the Second Jerusalem Council, whereby we really go back to the roots of our faith, where 
the beautiful thing happens like circumcision was a problem and now some people come and say like you have to become a jew first then only you can become a christian first which means what is the identity of a jewish person circumcision so you get circumcised then you become a so like it, what is the implication in a way it tells or it reserves only the jews can become christians so what is the implication is like other people are negated so now this problem when it came paul tells okay immediately he he does not try to solve so that's a really good thing because paul always refers to the apostolic origin the the real apostles team that was in jerusalem so he tells let's take the the, the problem there and they take it immediately instantly there is no delaying because often times when we delay the problems get aggravated so they immediately take it instant then effective consultation they come together and they tell and when they tell how do they tell we and the holy spirit together so the holy spirit is the prime agent of discussion or consultation but after this we forget the holy spirit when it comes to consultation then efficient coordination they tell like okay this is our rule you tell them and not to burden them with other things then finally impactful delegation so they tell not only send a message through apostles but they send also not only send a letter but send persons to authenticate the message that way that way jerusalem council is more advanced and more instructing to us than all the councils that have come after because all the councils that we have heard in the church more or less they are politically influenced by the, the space by the time that the context of the particular time but jerusalem council was not influenced but it was inspired by the holy spirit then we have some problems also like though even though they were apostles filled with the holy spirit they had their own human elements that's why they fight in between paul and barnabas separate in their second missionary journey when it came to taking mark so maybe paul had his own priorities which we are not sure so but the text the author plainly tells this is a problem that happened then there is a new mission model so what is the mission model here earlier in matthew we saw jesus gives a great command go and proclaim the good news but here the model is different where somebody is inviting paul come to macedonia and help us i think there is a mathean model of mission macedonian model of mission mathean model what happens you stand here and god is sending you you go from here but macedonian model what happens somebody is calling you come here we need you i think that type of mission is more inclusive and more liberative than i go and impose my gospel on other people so today what would be a lesson for us we need to understand where is my mission calling me so i need to listen to that macedonian man who comes in my dream and tells me come to macedonia and help us and you understand that that could be like suppose you are a parent your children are there your children could be your macedonia so you need not always say like i go to my children for claim no your children will call you come father come daddy we need to explore this or a workplace member could be your macedonia so when you find our macedonia we find our mission so paul was able to find it and how he was able to find it he was in touch with the holy spirit then finally gospel everywhere so there was no restricted place here we have 1630 and the sabbath day we went outside the gate to the river side where we supposed there was a place of prayer and we sat down and spoke to the women who had come together look at the text here sabbath day paul does not remain in his own house goes out looking for a place for prayer but no place is found he goes to the river side and river side becomes the place of gospel proclamation so gospel reaches everywhere and paul's integrity we have in the in the text 1628 for paul cried with a loud voice because now in this particular narrative uh, there is a miracle and all the uh, the chains of the paul the apostle paul and barnabas they are broken and the jailer thinks that they might have escaped but paul remains inside do not harm yourself for we are all here which means even though paul had an opportunity to get out of this place he was an integrity person of integrity and that integrity saved the entire house of the jailer so that way 
our integrity in workplace our integrity in family can save many people and at areobagus paul begins with what he saw to the unknown god and he begins to proclaim that unknown god then paul was a person who was earning his own bread he was a tent maker and he was doing that so it really uh, inspires our kind of a, uh, it makes us astonished to see how paul was able to write many literature many letters to meet many people to go different places and besides that he was able to be a tent maker so which means paul's hard work commitment integrity are lessons for us to learn then he was with apollos then many people say they apollos was uh, was later the writer of apollo was uh, writer of letter to the hebrews and this particular apollo causes division in the corinthian church as because some people said we are for paul some people said we are for kephas some said we are for apollo like they had their own followers but apollos was a very eloquent person and holy spirit so here the people at their faces they say when paul asked them do you, did you receive the holy spirit when you believe they said we have not even heard that there was holy spirit sometimes the holy spirit is a forgotten person in our life as well we forget that there is a person called holy spirit we need to remember and follow holy spirit wherever we are then paul's farewell at ephesus i said earlier i coveted no one silver or gold or apparel you yourselves know that these hands minister to my necessities and to those who were with me so here paul again talks about his integrity then suffering foretold so here paul's built and bound his own feet and hands so here already a person four tells the suffering of paul so kind of a mirroring between jesus and paul then paul's presence of mind when he was at the sanhedrin then paul's eucharistic celebration finally when paul was in the boat he celebrates his first eucharist then paul is in a rented house towards the end of the acts of the apostles and finally he meets the jews so kind of a homecoming he comes to his own persons at the end of his life then jewish mission and gentile mission we said earlier headed by peter then headed by paul gentile coming to the last slide that is significance of the book the four lessons are number one community community of believers like we come to understand how the early church had its own vulnerability uncertainty and fragility however it survived because god was the center of the community then secondly power of god so god was leading the entire church priority of prayer because the apostle said we will not serve at the table but we will be devoted to prayer and the ministry of the word and finally finally the prayer was leading to begin with the prayer in the upper room and prayer in the prison so from the upper room to the prison and rome paul and other disciples and the apostles were united in prayer good now for those who do this particular lesson as a course kindly take note of this assessment so we have two sections first one is objective type where we choose from the answers given here then we have paragraph answers first one how were the early christian communities technically named the way then number two how do we differently name the acts we can say road to rome the third one when was the ascension of jesus according to the acts 40 days after the resurrection then number 4 which of the triune god is mostly present holy spirit number 5 which was the end of the world rome then 6 how many people embraced christianity some 3000 but there is also evidence to possible 5000 so both answers could be correct then what was the most important council council of jerusalem could you name some of the prominent deacons stephen and philip then where did peter begin his gentile mission house of cornelius then what is the general tendency of the acts since the jews rejected the message it is taken to the gentiles these are the paragraph questions for the sub acts unity and disunity between luke and acts important theological trends pentecost gentile mission in acts and house of cornelius events so this paragraph questions and the other questions are only for the students those who take this particular lecture as part of their diploma 
expert. That concludes my presentation. Good. Thank you, Mr. Arun. Now, if you have any doubt, any clarification, any question, you are welcome. If you not able Adar. to talk, yes. Other? Yes, Adar. man. Yes, Adar, in uh, Acts 16 and uh, 16, 3, uh, Paul got the Timothy circumcised. Okay. But uh, in Galatians 2, 3, although mm. Titus was a Greek man, uh, both are Greek, uh, but uh, he was not circumcised. By, okay. He was not, uh, Paul was not intended to circumcise him. Yes. Why, Paul? Maybe kind of a, first there was a need, like Paul didn't want to see even in First Corinthians, I became all to all people. So, which means Paul always uh, decided or discerned according to the circumstance. So, that way, oh. when Paul was taking Timothy, the circumstance was that it was to a Jewish audience that not to scandalize them. He made that circumcision possible. But later, maybe when the Jerusalem Council enforced its own decision, maybe people might have been open. So, that way, I just needed to have circumcision. That's how we can understand it. Thank you, sir. Okay. Good. Uh, Father, any uh, significant uh, connection with Old Testament? Ah, okay. Can we do any text? I don't know. In general. Anything, any, because uh, in gospel, some of the thing is, is to be related with Isaiah and Exodus kind okay. of thing. Why is I'm asking any specific thing for uh, Good. Thank you, Mr. Arun, for the question. There are certain uh, similarities, and we have Mr. Samia Father Ryan also, he could say, uh, following scholar, he could throw more light on this. So maybe immediately what comes to my mind is a uh, uh, reversal of Babel, that could be an Old Testament motive. So there, at the Pentecostal, there is a reversal of Babel. And Old Testament prophecy of Joel, that at the end of times, that all the young men and old people will, will uh, speak in tongue will be filled with the Holy Spirit. So that filling up the Holy Spirit happens here. So that we can say Joel's prophecy is being fulfilled here. Uh, maybe maybe uh, this time I get only this. Maybe I may have to think or this to that. Good. So Babel and the Joel prophecy we can think of. If others could share also. Ryan, anything else? Very good. Good. Fine, then shall we call it a day? Good. Let's conclude with a small prayer. As we come to the end of the year, let us thank God for all the grace that he has showered upon us throughout this year, to our St. Paul's Bible College, to our Bible Commission, through our chairman, member, bishops, and all people present, and through every one of you, dear students, that we invoke his blessings for the new year, that we may continue to walk together, being filled with his Holy Spirit. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with you. Blessed are you among women, and blessed is the fruit of your Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners yes, now and at the hour of our death. Yes, Amen. Good. Thank you, everyone. This presentation will be available through our group, uh, St. Paul's Bible College group, and to others also I will share. And this video is being uploaded to our YouTube channel, St. Paul Bible College. Even our previous lectures are there. You could follow if you would like to. Good. Thank you, everyone. Happy Thank New Year. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father. Thank you. 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 Thank you.